Today we're going to talk about two of the most important Bibles leading up to the King James, and that is the Geneva Bible and the Bishop's Bible. The Geneva Bible, um, after the King James, is the most important of the English translations that we're going to talk about, and we'll kind of go over that a little bit. And the Bishop's Bible is actually produced in response to the Geneva. Um, by 1555, 1559, when Elizabeth comes to the throne, excuse me, when uh, um, in that era, the Great Bible was problematic at best. It was um, being used but it, it was also really, really difficult to use. The English, again, English now is really changing. Um, during the, 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 the time of Edward, the persecutions of Mary and now leading into the reign of Elizabeth, the, the, the Bible is really, really beginning to change. And um, one of the things that happens because of the persecutions of Mary, when Mary comes to the throne, and uh, tries to re-establish Catholicism in England, one of the things that happens is some people flee the country. Uh, they're called the Marian Exiles. And uh, the Marian Exiles um, depart England and, and the island and go to the continent. Remember we talked about Miles Coverdale. Miles Coverdale was arrested during the time of Mary, but because of his connections and his brother-in-law being the chaplain of the King of Denmark, uh, uh, Miles Coverdale was allowed to go into exile. Um, another important individual that uh, also goes into exile is a man named William Whittingham. William Whittingham is born in 1524 and he will die in 1579. Um, William Whittingham is, a, is an important scholar, and, and, and he really represents a, a, a new era of biblical scholarship in England, in the English language. And uh, he had fled uh, Mary's reign in 1554, uh, and he had gone to Frankfurt. Frankfurt, Germany, um, Geneva, Frankfurt, Germany, and Antwerp were popular destinations for Marian exiles. There were English sort of colonies there in the area. And um, he was uh, working in Frankfurt along with John Knox. John Knox had originally left Scotland and had gone to uh, Frankfurt and he was ministering there. Um, one of the things that happens is uh, while he is in, uh, while th this colony is, is in Frankfurt, there was a dispute amongst the, uh, the English uh, exiles in Frankfurt over the use of the Book of Common Prayer. Um, one faction wanted to keep the Book of Common Prayer the way it was, and there was another faction that wanted to rewrite it and, and make it more um, reform-oriented, make it more Calvinistically oriented. Um, and, and, and because of that split, um, because of that dispute, there was a split in the colony at Frankfurt, and some, including, first of all, being John Knox, John Knox goes to Geneva and begins to work with Calvin there, and he is made the pastor, the preacher, whatever you'd like to call him, of the English-speaking congregation in Geneva. Interestingly enough, the, the English and the Italians use the same facility uh, there in, uh, in, in Geneva. And um, William Whittingham 
stayed for a brief time in Frankfurt and tried to kind of patch things together and, and make the most out of the situation. But it became intolerable, and about six months later, he also moved to Geneva. Um, the Geneva Bible, to kind of um, give it an overview, was produced in 1560. It's called the Geneva Bible because that's where it was created. It was created in Geneva, Switzerland, um, there where, uh, where, where Calvin had uh, um, basically, that was his city. He was in charge of the city by this time. Um, and it would remain the Bible of choice for English Protestants for the next hundred years. Uh, even after the King James Bible is produced in 1611 and issued, and in fact, today, May 2nd, is the 401st anniversary of the printing of the King James Version of the Bible by Robert Barker, printer to His Majesty's Most Excellent Grace. And uh, so today's the anniversary of that, so it's a nice day to have class. Um, but even uh, in 1611, the Geneva Bible probably was at its peak of popularity and would remain popular probably for another 50 years before the King James finally and completely usurps it. Um, and again, part of that was the King James updated the language, uh, the Geneva, ge people just lost interest. Um, and frankly, what they lost interest in was not so much the Geneva Bible as a translation, but they, they began to lose interest in the very dogmatic, um, Puritan-leaning notations that were in the Bible. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. The, 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 the stri what, we, what we would really call strident um, puritanical notes and, and puritanical theology really falls out of favor in England. England will remain, by and large, the Church of England will remain evangelical, um, but there's still a ways to go. Remember, England is going to have, uh, um, after James, you're going to have Charles I, who's going to be overthrown and executed. You're going to have Cromwell in the protectorate, and then the reestablishment of the monarchy, the Glorious Revolution, and then modern England that we have today. England is going to remain largely evangelical, but much more mildly Calvinistic after Cromwell. And, um, and, and even up to the time of Cromwell, the Geneva Bible was still popular. But uh, that won't continue. The Geneva Bible will go through 140 editions. Not simply reprinting. They, they, they were always, it'll continue to be tinkered with. After Calvin is off the scene, after... The, the Reformation is really established in, in England and, and evangelicalism is established in England and, and Catholicism is, is really removed by law from English society. Um, Beza in Geneva will continue to work on it. It'll continue to be tinkered with. Um, and, and that probably helps lead to its downfall. To a, to a degree that there were, in, in the space of a hundred years, there were 140 different editions of it. It was, the wording was always being tinkered with. The notes were always being tinkered with. You never really knew what was up with it. And, and to a, a, a certain degree, um, by the end of its duration, the English land, language had modernized, had standardized, and, and, and people honestly were, wanted a Bible. And they, and, and they didn't want to keep tinkering with it. Um, 
at a certain level the success of the Geneva Bible was also its ultimately its downfall um, in terms of popularity. Um, it was they, they were they were constantly uh, uh, changing it, not major changes, but just constantly changing it. Um, Spurgeon would say uh, a couple of 150 some odd years later in the 1870s when he lectured to his students, he talked about the deficiencies of the King James Bible, but he told his students when you're preaching um, to be careful to about constantly trying to correct the King James Bible in your sermons. He said you, you don't want to um, get in the habit of doing that because it tends to um, the, the, the common uneducated Christian in the pew, it began to erode their confidence in the scripture. The, the, Spurgeon said, you know, uh, um, the grandmother in the pew who has the King James Bible, and that's the only Bible they ever have had, if you are continually trying to uh, um, correct it in your sermons, and Spurgeon acknowledged, he says, it's the King James has lots of deficiencies that were evident by the 1880s. Um, it hadn't been updated in, uh, since 1769. Um, but he said, you have to be careful about that. And you know, a little aside, even in, in preaching, you know, we get, out of, we get guys out of Master Seminary and, and you're trained in the languages, you, you understand them, maybe sometimes you understand them just enough to be dangerous. And, and be careful when you, when you preach. You know, you're saying, well, this translates this way, but you know, it really, be, just sometimes you have to do that. But I think it's also a, a good warning that Spurgeon has to, to, to not do that over much and not do it uh, in a way that causes people to think the Bible they have in their hand isn't reliable. So that was a, and I think that's, one of the things that really uh, contributed to the to the Geneva, they were they were so enthused about accuracy and so much trying to keep up, and the English language was changing so much, it was just constantly being revised. And and I mean, 140 editions in 100 years is just too much of anything. So uh, uh, that was a little bit. It was uh, there. There's several notable features about the the Geneva Bible. One, one writer said that it was so superior to the Great Bible in terms of English usage that, that it was said to have driven the Great Bible from the field by the sheer force of its brilliance. And that's true. Now, we're not talking about the Great... Remember, we talked about the Great Bible. It was not brilliant to start with. And uh, so it didn't take a lot, but it, it, did, uh, uh, it did work. The, the Geneva Bible is the first English Bible to use the modern chapter and verse divisions. The chapter and verse divisions in previous ones had been an older uh, subset that, that wasn't being used anymore. Um, it contained notations not only on difficult words and phrases, but interpretations of the scripture itself. Those, in, those interpretations were strongly Calvinistic. In that, they took Calvin's readings. They very often were Calvin's commentaries. They are what Calvin was teaching in Geneva. Now remember, the Geneva Bible in its, in its early edition, remember one thing, Calvin's final version of the Institutes has not been done yet. So the Institutes that were available was one of the early editions by Calvin. So the big two volume Institutes that we are familiar with now, that hadn't been produced yet. Um, it was a much shorter um, uh, work. Calvin's first edition of the Institutes was a was really a small, um, almost an abridged version of, of what he would later uh, add to. And so the notes there often take a uh, uh, Calvin's interpretation of a passage, with some exceptions. Um, it was really the first study Bible. 
The Geneva Bible is the first study Bible in history. It was designed to be that. Um, the Geneva Bible was the first Bible to come to the American colonies uh, with the Mayflower in 1620, although there was apparently a, a, a couple of King James Bibles on that voyage. It was still the, the, the pilgrims uh, who came over in 1620 uh, were uh, still strongly committed to the Geneva Bible. In fact, many of the pilgrims uh, believed that the King James Bible was, was a massive compromise of doctrine and everything else. Remember your history. Um, all pilgrims were Puritans, but not all Puritans were pilgrims. The pilgrims who came over on the Mayflower tended to be the most um, strident. They were the most uh, conservative. Um, they also, the Puritans who came over in 1620, uh, tended to be primarily middle, upper middle class, tended not to have been um, educated in the, they were not Oxford, Cambridge educated for the most part. They were, a lot of them were college educated, but they were in the secondary schools. The Puritans who would come later to America, then you get the influx of the Cambridge, Oxford educated uh, scholars. So there, there's a slight difference in that. And they also tended to be not as um, strident, which is probably the best way of, of phrasing it in, in terms of their uh, uh, beliefs. Remember that the pilgrims did not come to America for pluralism, for religious freedom. They, they didn't come to America, into the American colonies, you know, so they could have religious freedom in the colonies. They came to the colonies so they could have a colony for their religion. I mean, the, the, the early American colonies uh, treatment of non-Calvinists, non-Puritans or non-Pilgrims was often very, very harsh. Um, Quakers, especially, uh, were, were often taken to the edge of town and thrown out of town. And the edge of town and being thrown out of town is being left to the, the Indians and the wild animals. Um, you really don't get, until you get William Penn establishing the colony in Pennsylvania, which was Quaker, and Rhode Island. Rhode Island is the first of, and, and the, first of the American colonies that, that really was um, had religious toleration. There were no religious tests for anything in Rhode Island. That's why you have uh, the Baptists tended to thrive in Rhode Island. Brown University in Rhode Island was a Baptist school. Um, and so you have those kinds of things going on as well. So the uh, uh, Geneva Bible, very, very important. And here is a Geneva Bible. And one of the most remarkable things, this is a 1599 printing, one of the most remarkable things about the Geneva Bible is its size. It was the first Bible produced in mass quantities that somebody could pick up and carry around with them. It was the first Bible that um, there, there's even a smaller one than this printing that would pretty much fit in your pocket. And it was produced for that reason. This is the this is the, this is really the culmination of what Tyndall wanted when he talked about having a Bible in the hands of everybody. This is what he was talking about. So not only a Bible in the English language, but a Bible that somebody could pick up. Now we're used to this. Th this size Bible. Uh, is just like what you have there on your desks, what I have in my office, what we go to church with every Sunday. Um, but this was a radical departure from the size of Bibles. Most Bibles up to this time were enormous pulpit Bibles or podium Bibles, what we call folio size. They were very, very large. 
Um, they didn't move easily. You certainly wouldn't carry them around uh, uh, to church. And this is a, uh, not only uh, were there notations in this Bible, there were uh, maps, there are uh, drawings, there's uh, a drawing here that, that's hard to see from this angle, but it's a, it's a drawing of the temple with, with a, a, a diagram and a, a detail of what, what it looked like. And so for the first time, you're really handing people, you're handing believers a Bible they can look at and begin to not only understand uh, the, the text, not only read the text, but begin to understand the interpretation of the text and some background information so you can say you know they didn't know what temples look like now this is a, a, a not going to be the best uh, picture of the temple and in fact the the map um is it in the new testament yeah the new testament there's a map of israel and the mediterranean coast which is is awful <laughs> i mean in terms of geography it's not even close but it's it was something it was an improvement over what existed. And so it, it, it really, uh, again, the very first study Bible, the very first uh, um, Bible in English. The other thing that it did was uh, William Whittingham and the others who worked on it were Hebrew scholars. The Geneva Bible is the first Bible that the Old Testament is translated from the Hebrew from beginning to end. And it is, it is, you know, remarkably well done. There was also a sense in which they were not only um, Hebrew and Greek and biblical scholars, but because of where they were, because of being in Geneva, because of, of them having this kind of colony of people that they had to deal with, which is rel re relatively small. We're not talking about thousands of people uh, of English colonists in Geneva. We're talking about, you know, really never much more than about 200. Um, and so they wrote in a very forceful language. They wrote in it. They they wrote in a manner after Tyndale. They translated. Um, into English, an English that was familiar to the average everyday person, familiar to this uh, group of people. And so it was a uh, um, remarkable accomplishment. Um, the notations are often simple explanations of a word. Um, simple explanations of a passage. Uh, sometimes they are um, uh, simply encouragements. Sometimes they are proverbial in nature. Um, sometimes they are uh, um, theological. Um, and sometimes they're vicious. The notations of the Geneva Bible, and and I and I and I largely have to disagree in many places. David Daniel in his in his text that you're reading, he tries to soften this up a bit, but the fact of the matter is, if you read the notes, some of them are are really really vicious. Um, they are vicious against Catholicism, which I'm going to show you one in a second, um, and, and and they are very often. Uh, anti-monarchial. In other words, they're against the, the monarch. Uh, they're not so much against the monarch as uh, they're not against monarchialism. They are against that particular monarch. They, they, are, they are not friendly towards the concept of the divine right of kings as the king was. The, the, the Puritans uh, were not opposed to a king, but they wanted it to be their king. 
They, they were not opposed to the concept of monarchy per se, but they were opposed to an absolute monarchy. Uh, they were opposed to uh, the idea that, that um, the monarch controlled the affairs of the church. They were opposed to Hen they were opposed to basically every idea that Henry VIII put forward. And so they didn't want a pope because that didn't work. And they didn't want a king or a queen who had power over the church. They, they sort of wanted, uh, they wanted the church to control the government um, as Calvin did at Geneva. I mean, there was a civil government in Geneva, but Calvin called the shots. I mean, he was the pastor of the church and he was the leading theologian and the civil authorities kind of took their lead from him. They, 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 they believed in theocracy. And out of this, you're gonna get a couple of different ways church polity is gonna go. The Presbyterians under John Knox in Scotland um, and you're gonna, you're, you're, and, and different things. Remember when, when James, we'll talk about this next week, when James comes to the throne after, after the death of Elizabeth, remember James the first of England had been James of Scotland. Scotland was uh, in, it, in its governmental structure and its ecclesiastical structure, Presbyterian. He was a monarch of a Presbyterian country. Um, the, the, the Presbyterians in England hoped that he would uh, um, alter the Church of England to make it Presbyterian in England. Well, that, certainly, that simply wasn't gonna happen because of whatever you wanna say about James, he was smart enough to realize and he made the statement, no bishop, no monarch. He understood that to remove the ecclesiastical structure of, of of bishops and, and a hierarchical system in the church would ultimately mean uh, um, that the monarchy itself would be threatened. And so he, he understood that. And, and so when he became, he inherited Presbyterianism in Scotland, he didn't like it. Um, and one of the things he didn't like, uh, um, especially about the Geneva Bible was the notations. Now, the notations were the problem. When Elizabeth comes to the throne, Elizabeth herself was a formidable scholar like her father had been. She understood Greek. She was a, a, a very good writer herself. She did some, you know, she understood the issues. And uh, she liked the Geneva Bible as a translation, as a rendering of the scripture into English. She really liked the Geneva Bible. And in fact, she authorized it to be printed in England. Her new Archbishop of Canterbury is a man named Matthew Parker. Matthew Parker had been Elizabeth's mother's chaplain. Um, Elizabeth's mother had committed the care and the education of Elizabeth to Matthew Parker. When Elizabeth becomes queen, Elizabeth went to Matthew Parker to become the new Archbishop of Canterbury, which was the functional ecclesiastical head of the Church of England. Now, Matthew Parker wasn't particularly interested in that job. Um, he was a scholar, not so much an administrator, but he was, he was loyal. And, and Elizabeth asked him to take the job, he took the job. Um, they both understood that the Great Bible, which was the authorized Bible of England at the time, 
uh, nobody was using anymore. It was, it was falling out of usage because of the popularity of the Geneva Bible. And, and both Parker and Elizabeth understood that if the text of the Geneva Bible continues to be popular, the notations and the underlying theology of the Geneva Bible will march on unchecked. And so Parker prevailed upon the queen to um, authorize a new Bible to compete with the Geneva Bible, to supplant it, if you will. And that Bible was the Bishop's Bible, which we'll talk about in just a second. But I just wanted to kind of give you the transition. Does that make sense so far? Any questions? Um, the notes in the Geneva Bible are, obviously we, we can't go through all of the notes, but um, I want to take you to Revelation 20. They have an interesting, the, the Geneva Bible uh, um, with Calvin's notes at the time, although he would, I think, change his uh, version of this. Uh, when you get to Revelation 20, you have the thousand years. Remember you have, and I'm sorry, I have to use a magnifying glass so if I look kind of silly, because this is really, really small type and I'm getting old. Um, remember you have in, in, in uh, verse three, or verse two, and they took the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And you have that whole discussion there in Revelation 20, very, very important passage. Um, how are you going to interpret it? Here are the notes of the, Geneva, of the Geneva Study Bible notes where we're talking about that. Um, and it talks about the, uh, the thousand years. What is that? Um, that the, the, the dragon. Um, in terms of history, what they say, this is prophetic and it's talking about the thousand years after the death of Christ up to basically 1036. So we'll, we'll see, what he, see what they say here. Um, the, the, I've lost my place because this is small type. That is of hell. It was, um, here it is. In the, 30, the 36th year from the Passion of Christ, when the church of the Jews was being overthrown, Satan assailed to... Um, into the Christian church gathered with the Gentiles and to destroy part of her feed. Um, then the sands, the, the sands were uh, precisely upon the time until the wicked Hildebrand, in other words, uh, um, who is called Gregory, Gregory the Great. So Gregory the Great is the culmination of the thousand years. Now here, here's what they say about Gregory the Great, Hildebrand. Gregory the Great, uh, Hildebrand, who is called Gregory uh, the, the, um, the Ferocious, a most damnable necromancer and sorcerer, who Satan um, basically empowers and was an instrument, uh, um, as an instrument loosed out of bounds and therefore to annoy the saints of God with most cruel persecutions and the whole world with divinations and most bloody wars. And then he goes and talks about uh, uh, one of the cardinals and, uh, um, and goes on and, and talks about uh, basically the, the, the notations were, as we might expect, very anti-Catholic. Um, but to call, you know, to call, to call uh, Gregory the Great a, a, a sorcerer, a necromancer, uh, empowered by Satan, um, that's, uh, um, that's kind of what, uh, that's their notation. So the thousand years are from the passion of Christ until the coming of, of, uh, of Hildebrand, of, of Gregory the Great. And so there, there are different things like that. And, and there, are, there are a lot of notes like that that um, 
that are very, very uh, um, ill, uh, um, very, very strident, let's just say. And, and But that is, uh, uh, but not all of them, but there are enough of them. And when you turn that kind of language against the monarchy or against a, a more mild Calvinism, which is what Elizabeth was after, the 39 articles were a little bit more mild in their Calvinism, uh, a little bit more mild in terms of predestination, things like that. And um, the, 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 the Puritans were, you know, really, really, you know, this is the way it is, very, very strident, uh, really not willing to compromise. The Puritans were not into pluralism. It was, you know, basically they wanted their little uh, uh, part of the world. And so it was a, uh, um, a very, very difficult uh, um, situation for the Geneva. Because, or for Elizabeth and for Matthew Parker, because while they liked the text, the translation was excellent, they couldn't keep the notations. They had to figure out a way to get the translation and the, the, the scripture itself into the language of the people and divorce it from all of these notes that they really didn't like. And so the answer was, the Bishop's Bible. Um, the Bishop's Bible is produced in uh, 1568 with a significant revision in 1572. Um, when Elizabeth comes to the throne in 1550, Elizabeth again reigns from 1553 to 1603. She is on the throne a long time. Uh, again, remember, she, she comes to the throne after Mary uh, her half-sister uh, dies, and um, Elizabeth um, just drops the hammer on the Catholic resurgence. She despises Catholicism. She mainly despises Catholicism because um, Mary had had begun to align herself, obviously, with her husband, who was the king of Spain, and 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 Elizabeth understood. Elizabeth was the political genius that her father Henry VIII was. She understood that England was poised to move forward, and and she was looking at England as empire. And, and Elizabeth is the one who's going to build it. Uh, Elizabeth is the monarch of Sir Francis Drake. She is the monarch of the expansion of the navy, the expansion of the empire. Uh, so she's going to be the one who does that. Um, and and she, she doesn't want to share any of that with the Pope, with the, with the Catholic countries. And she was also smart enough to see what the struggle between Catholicism and Protestantism was doing on the continent. Unending, unceasing wars. England comes out of that pretty well because England's an island. England sends troops, but there aren't enormous wars. The infrastructure, the economy, everything of England sort of uh, survives all of that. And, and England really, when Elizabeth comes to the throne, is poised to move into empire building, to become the significant power in, uh, in Europe. And they will become the power in Europe, and, and, and they will become, you know, really the dominant world power for the next several hundred years. The Bishop's Bible um, then was her uh, approved uh, concept that Matthew Parker brought to her said we need a Bible that is uh, Anglican that is more Church of England ish something that can be used in the services something that re replaces the great Bible and everyone understood the great Bible was was just terrible uh, it, it never was a good translation um, she wasn't 
adamantly opposed to the uh, Calvinistic viewpoints. I mean, she wasn't a, a, a she wasn't theologically opposed as much a, a, to the Puritans as uh, some were. But the one thing she was opposed to that 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 she despised John Knox and equally did not like John Calvin didn't mind the Protestant theology didn't like Calvin and John Knox at all uh, viewed them very much viewed them very much like her father viewed Martin Luther as as um, somebody ultimately who would uh, see to it that they would overthrow uh, the monarchies in, in favor of, of themselves. Um, Elizabeth noted that the that, that Calvin was just a, a theological monarch. You know he he was he was monarch he he he, he says. Calvin basically was was monarch without heredity, um, and and she saw that as and and most uh, uh, of her her persuasion saw that as as ultimately as anarchy. Whoever had uh, um, the 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 sway of the people at that point uh, could overthrow monarchs. And uh, um, she just really didn't care for them at all. Obviously didn't like the notes. Um, so she approved Matthew Parker's work on the Bishop's Bible. Now the Bishop's Bible is notable for lots of reasons. It was, it was a significant improvement over the uh, uh, Great Bible. And while the Bishop's Bible is often called the second authorized version of the Bible, it really wasn't. When Matthew Parker finishes, when they finally get this done, and we're going to talk about that, Elizabeth never authorizes it. In other words, she never singularly decrees that the Bishop's Bible is the Bible to be used in the church. Um, it has Matthew Parker's approval, and so it is used in the church, but it never gets that royal decree, that royal authorization that the Great Bible had under Henry and that the King James Bible will have under James, which really hurt Parker. He really was stung by that. Um, and and um, but he didn't, you know, he 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 dies by 1575. So Elizabeth really outlives him by, you know, by uh, 28 years. Although William Shakespeare will quote the Bishop's Bible, it is not the only Bible that he quotes in his work. Shakespeare often quotes the Geneva Bible. But he does quote the Bishop's Bible quite frequently. Um, one of the drawbacks of the Bishop's Bible was the poor quality of the Old Testament, um, which was little more than a rough translation of the Vulgate in places. Uh, Daniel states, and I think accurately so, the Hebrew work in the Bishop's Bible of 1582 was a botch and was understood to be so. However, the Bishop's Bible was important for one main reason, and that was it was the starting point for the King James. And what, what Matthew Parker does is he set up a committee. He set up a translation committee. It's called the Bishop's Bible because the bishops translate it. Now, remember our, our, our discussion last time about the, uh, the Great Bible and the uh, uh, Bible that uh, 
that, that Cramner wanted to get done, but never could because he could never get the bishops to you know, get off the dime and get the work done. Uh, Matthew Parker had a little bit more success and uh, was able to get uh, uh, quite a, you know, to get the work done in a little bit quicker time. And, and Parker does a couple of interesting things. One is, in the early editions of the Bishop's Bible, at the end of the individual books were the initials of the bishop who translated that Bible to hold them accountable. Uh, he set up a, a, uh, a committee system uh, much more elaborate even than the Geneva Bible. Uh, it was The Geneva Bible was a lot of people involved, but it wasn't a committee. It wasn't like we have translation committees now. Matthew Parker really puts that into place. And he was the chief editor. Now, unfortunately, the, the editorial process of Parker, he didn't go back and, and correct and change other people's contributions. And, and there were a lot of reasons for that. Uh, Parker himself was not uh, um, a Hebrew scholar at all. And, uh, but he sets in place that concept, that kind of structure. And it's going to be followed by the King James translators, who we'll talk about next week, had an elaborate committee where things were checked and double-checked. Different committees working on different parts of the Bible. The other thing the Bishop's Bible does is um, it continues with the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha is, is the, the Great Bible had the Apocrypha, the Bishop's Bible has the Apocrypha, the Geneva Bible didn't. The Geneva Bible is the only one of these English Bibles that does not include the Apocrypha. Even the King James Bible will have the Apocrypha in it in its first editions. Matthew Parker is important for several reasons. Uh, he was a scholar, but he was a scholar of a classical sense. He was a Latinist. He, he, the, the scholarly language of the day was still Latin. He wrote in Latin. He thought in Latin. He read the, 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 the church fathers in Latin. And as a result, he was much better at Latin than he was at English. He was not a good English scholar. He did not write good English prose. His translations, uh, um, and, and he does quite a bit of the translation himself, his translations tended to reflect that. They tended to be a, a, a little clunky. In Psalm 23, 5, where it talks about, you know, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Uh, um, Parker translates it, and, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord for a very long time. <laughs> it was, which is a literal rendering of the words, but it, it didn't kind of express things very well. And um, Parker and, and Parker's, the, the Bishop's Bible Psalms were terrible. Um, the, the, the Psalms of the Bishop's Bible were were unsingable. And in fact, the Psalms out of the Great Bible in a subsequent, in, in a subsequent printing in 1572, the Psalms were replaced. Because people were, the one thing the Great Bible did well was the Psalms in terms of there was rhythm and meter to them and they could be sung. The Bishop's Bible translation of the Psalms, you tried to sing those in church and, and it, was just, it was impossible. They, they sounded awful. And so they were uh, um, ultimately replaced. But the Bishop's Bible was the, the starting point for the King James. When James comes along in 1611, uh, 
and or before that when he's he's setting it up to to authorize the printing and the con the committee is set up uh, James provided the committee 40 copies 40 loose leaf copies of the bishop's bible uh, their instructions were in fact to update the bishop's bible to adjust the translation where necessary um, to have as few marginal notations as possible, although even I mean, some people say the King James was was not you know one that the James wanted no marginal notations, and that that's not really the case. He wasn't opposed to marginal translations that um, talked about the language, you know, that that discussed words, but he didn't want interpretations. He didn't want things uh, uh, like that in the in the King James Bible. Uh, one of only one of the editorial editions of the Bishop's Bible is known to exist, and it's at the Bodleian Library at Oxford in England. And I've said this before: the 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 best analogy that I can that I can bring is um, the Constitutional Convention of. of in, in the United States in 1887. Uh, remember the United States uh, is brought into existence and their first constitution was called the Articles of the Confederation. And um, it wasn't working. Um, individual states were going to war with each other. It was really just a mess. Uh, it provided for no presidency. Uh, it was a very, very weak central government. And, and the colonies, the, the, the United States that had finally gotten their freedom from England was falling apart. And a, a constitutional convention was called to revise the Articles of the Confederation to try to make this thing work. Um, and that was their charge. And uh, the, the very famous statement by Patrick Henry of Virginia who did not attend was that he says, I smell a rat. And um, the delegates got to the Constitutional Convention, looked at the Articles of Confederation, said revising, basically revising this was impossible, and they set to work on creating what ultimately became the United States Constitution. The, the King James translators were given the same kind of task. They were, they were told, take the Bishop's Bible, revise it, fix it. They looked at it, it was an impossible task, they abandoned it, and it probably is why only one of the um, Bishop's Bible copies for the committee still exists is because they didn't use it. They abandoned the task and then went to work to create the King James Version of the Bible, which would then become the dominant, essentially unchallenged, uh, English Bible for the next 350 years.